Hello friends, I am Arpit and I am here with today's analysis. Today is 26th of December and we are going to deal with three very important topics which are in news. The first topic is the India-ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. This India-ASEAN Free Trade Agreement was signed in the year 2009 for goods in 2014 for services. And this is presently in news because both these, I would say, entities, India and ASEAN, which is a grouping of 10 Southeast Asian countries, they want to modernize this particular trade agreement. At that time, you know, when this trade agreement was signed, the trade deficit was, you know, for India, it was around 7 to $8 billion. And now it has increased to more than $50 billion. This is one such concerning factor for India that is why they want to modernize or do changes in this free trade agreement. The negotiations start in the coming February. The second topic, Rohingyas in Andaman and Nicobar Island. Now, the Indian Coast Guard has capsized or seized a boat comprising of 142 individuals. All these individuals, the Rohingyas. These Rohingyas had been coming from Bangladesh. Well, you might have, you know, heard about Rohingyas coming from Myanmar. But yes, a lot of Rohingyas have been relocated in Bangladesh since 2017. It is believed that these Rohingyas were going to Indonesia from there, from, from Bangladesh. So, you know, the United Nations Commission on Refugees it has, you know, applauded India's efforts for taking them into custody, keeping them safe, giving them food and shelter. That is why this was a news. And the last topic for today will be Mr. S. J. Shankar visiting Russia. Now, this is a very, very important visit because every year up till 2021, there was a summit between India and Russia where the Prime Minister of India and the President of Russia, they used to meet. But since 2022, since the last summit happened in 2021, since 2022, no such meetings have happened. This is owing to the Russia-Ukraine war. In this visit of Mr. S. Jay Shankar, he will be discussing all the, you know, existing areas of cooperation with Russia, which we have, that is defense, energy cooperation or we, we, we talk also talk about connectivity with them, how to increase overall trade, the rupee ruble settlement, all these things will be under consideration. So let's get started with the first topic. India ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. Now, in order to get into this topic, we should first understand that what is a free trade agreement. Okay. Now, there is there are two countries, A, B, or we can consider this as India, this as ASEAN for the time being. ASEAN is a group of 10 countries. So with this grouping of 10 countries, we signed a free trade agreement in 2009. Now, import and export happens. Import and export means trade happens. India exports some, imports some. So while exporting, you know, let's suppose there is a product of 100 rupees here in India. While exporting, export duty of 10 rupees is levied on that. Import duty by ASEAN countries is levied of let's suppose 15 rupees. So when this product, which is costing 100 rupees, enters the market of B, it will cost 100 plus 10 plus 15. That is 125 rupees. Collectively, export duty and import duty are called as tariffs. Now coming to this thing that what is a free trade agreement? It is an agreement between two parties. Here in this case, two parties A and B. Where they mutually sit and discuss an agreement where they aim to increase trade and investment in each other's countries by reducing the tariffs or 
I would say making the tariffs zero. Because if the tariffs are reduced or if the tariffs are made zero, then the prices will be competitive. This 125 will be around 100 only. If the tariffs are made zero. So this will make trade more competitive and hence trade will increase. And this has been the scenario. Especially, you know, when we talk about free trade agreements with any, any country, our trade has increased with those countries manifold. So is free trade agreement only an agreement or only an innovation of India? No, it is there. Everyone is doing it. So it is like this. Now, India and ASEAN had this free trade agreement in 2009 signed for goods, trade in goods and 2014 the ambit was increased and it was including services also. Now India and ASEAN will begin negotiations on their already existing free trade agreement. This free trade agreement is named as ASEAN India Trade in Goods Agreement AITGA. So yeah, this is 2009 because it was good. FTAs are treaties between two country, two or more countries designed to reduce or eliminate certain barriers to trade. Barriers to trade means tariffs are considered as barriers to trade because this will tariffs if they will be there, they will make the trade less competitive. Now, what is the need to renegotiate? First is to modernize the pact. How we are aiming to modernize, what all elements we are going to add, we will see. And the trade deficit for India is high. Trade deficit simply means that India is exporting less and importing more. So let's suppose India is exporting goods worth $100 billion. It is importing goods worth $107.5 billion in 2009. The trade deficit became $7.5 billion. But now this trade deficit has widened to 43.57 billion dollars means this is the resultant of India's exports minus imports or imports minus exports. So India is importing more and exporting less. So this trade deficit is widening. This is concerning India right now and they want to you know, make things more I would say clear with Asia. Now this is something which we need to know. First of all, what is ASEAN? So ASEAN is a grouping of 10 countries. Okay. These 10 countries, Laos, Myanmar, Thailand, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Brunei. So it is there in the Southeast Asian region. 1, 2, 3, 4. So it is there. Now it was formed in the year 1967. Now in 1967, who were the founding members? So we need to know this as well. So the founding members were Thailand, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The ones which I have encircled with blue were the founding members because UPSC can ask questions to this detail also. The founding members of ASEAN were. We all know present these 10 members are there. But these 10 members were not there in 1967 when it was formed. Only 5 were there. Now aim was promoting the socio-economic growth political stability of individual countries and regional stability among its members. So socio-economic, political, I would say integration it is there so that, you know, uh, individually the countries benefit and the entire region also benefits. This is something which they are aiming at. Headquarters is in Jakarta. Dialogue partners. There are eight dialogue partners of ASEAN and eight dialogue partners, China, India, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, Russia and USA. These are the eight dialogue partners and ASEAN plus these eight dialogue partners comprise to form 
a grouping called as East Asia Summit. That is why whenever, you know, uh, summits of ASEAN countries happen, it is coupled with East Asia Summit also. Like this year also, the Prime Minister was visiting Indonesia where there was an ASEAN Summit and there was this East Asia Summit also. The Indonesian President desperately wanted the Indian Prime Minister to visit but Indian Prime Minister refused to visit because G20 Summit in September was lined up just two days after that. But on the special request of the Indonesian president, the Indian Prime Minister visited just two days before the G20 summit here in New Delhi. And those ASEAN countries also did something which was unprecedented. Earlier, you know, it was a two-day schedule. On first day, East Asia summit. Second day, ASEAN summit. Or something like this. Or first day, ASEAN summit. Second day, East Asia summit. They rescheduled the entire program and made it a one-day affair just to accommodate Indian Prime Minister's presence. Because Indian Prime Minister could not take out two days at that time. So this is, you know, this clearly signifies or highlights India's growing significance in the ASEAN region. Now, what does modernization or modernizing the trade agreement mean? First is incorporating rules of origin. Now, let's understand again this A, B, trade happening. If FTA happens, this export duty, import duty will either reduce or become zero. It is not every time it is becoming zero. It can either, it can reduce also. So trade will be cheap. It will be, you know, uh, more competitive. Now, what if? A third country with which A does not have any agreement. A is not having any agreement with C. No agreements. But C is sending its products to B. Maybe it is having an agreement with B. Or let's suppose it is not having. But yes, C is sending its products to B. Now from B, those products are coming to A. Because if any product comes from B to A, it will be under the ambit of free trade agreement. So, in this way, the products of country C are entering country A where, you know, tariffs are not taken. So, this is, you know, C taking undue advantage of an agreement between A and B. And this is what was happening. In this case, A is India, B is Asia, and C is China. China, we do not have an agreement with China. Without agreement, only the trade is so high. So China, in order to make its products more competitive in Indian market, it was selling it to you know ASEAN countries, and from there those products are coming to India. So it was like this. Now, incorporating rules of origin. Now, in this free trade agreement, what we want to do? We want to incorporate rules of origin. Rules of origin simply means that where that product has originated. If that product has originated anywhere outside B, then tariff will be levied on those products. If any product has originated in B and then coming to A from B, then this product will come under the ambit of FTA. So it is like this. These are called as rules of origin. Rules of origin are the criteria to determine the origin of a product and establish if it qualifies for the duty cuts under free trade agreement. Now China has been routing some of its products via ASEAN in India to take advantage of the FTA. Now we did not have this rules of origin, I would say, clause in the free trade agreement, which we now intend to put. The modernized FTA will have a chapter on trade remedies, which will seek to provide a safety net for domestic industries against unfair trade practices or unforeseen surges in import of goods. So this is going to be the second inclusion under the ambit of modernization of the already existing free trade agreement. Well, 
you know there were questions being asked by ministry of external affairs officials that are you going to include elements like women empowerment or msmes or something like this so they said clearly that no this we are not going to do this this will complicate the free trade agreement we are only going to simplify it and modernize it and this is how we are going to simplify and modernize it now the second piece of news rohingyas in andaman and nicobar island the united nations high commissioner for refugees has applauded you know and expressed gratitude to the indian government because they you know first of all capsize or they intercepted a boat having 152 rohingya refugees 47 of them were women 59 minors whose boat was intercepted by coastal security agencies near the shahid dweep shahid dweep is in andaman and nicobar island now this boat left from bangladesh 14 to 15 days ago and was on its way to indonesia so they were going to indonesia from bangladesh now who are the rohingyas we need to understand this they are an ethnic group largely muslims actually rohingyas are some of them are hindus also some of them are buddhists also but largely they are muslims living in the rakhine state of myanmar now they were not granted citizenship by myanmar and labeled as resident foreigners or associate citizens they were labeled like this they fled their homes in 2017 obviously they had been granting citizenship or they they have been demanding citizenship they were devoid of certain facilities in myanmar because they were not citizens of myanmar and their demand or i would say that their long standing demand of citizenship was not fulfilled now in 2017 there was an incident where you know some rohingyas were involved in raping a buddhist woman over there in uh, myanmar buddhists are in majority over there and these obviously rohingya muslims are in minority so after that incident there was a heavy crackdown by the myanmar's army on them and they started to flee away from myanmar the united nations has clearly depicted them or labeled them as the most persecuted minority now they fled some of them went to bangladesh some of them went to asean countries southeast asia particularly indonesia where muslim population is huge and some of them came to india also now we need to understand this that how has been india's response to the rohingya crisis now our response to the rohingya crisis is largely calibrated or assessed in three phases i would say now first phase was 2012 india considered the crisis as an internal matter of myanmar and allowed refugees to enter india india was largely silent on this did not interfere did not condemn the myanmar's government and was silent one reason behind india's stand of remaining silent and allowing rohingyas to enter into india was china china was also doing the same because a lot of rohingyas were fleeing to china as well and we knew at that time that if we oppose something then myanmar a neighboring country also the gateway to southeast asia because southeast asia starts from myanmar will you know easily drift towards china so we stayed silent on that matter now at that time in myanmar a democratically elected government was also there but that government was largely under the military junta it was after 2015 that aung san suu kyi's national league for democracy came to power in myanmar so a military junta centric government military junta more inclined towards china if we would have said anything you know they would be more inclined towards China. So this was our approach during that phase. Phase two, two thousand seventeen, India started to deport Rohingyas and launched Operation Insaniyat to relocate Rohingyas in Bangladesh. Now in Bangladesh, there is an island named as Bahasan Char Island. This Bahasan Char Island is an uninhabited island where it was agreed to by the government of Bangladesh. that we will relocate the rohingyas on this island india readily agreed and india said that we will support you we'll give you all the support to establish that island 
and we will also send rohingyas over here in india on that island they will also live so that operation was named as operation insaniyat now why you know, bangladesh chose to do that because it is believed that these rohingya muslims were historically you know inhabitants of bangladesh at that time it was east bengal during the britishers and myanmar at one point of time was also a province under british india after the anglo burmese war you know when the britishers won they made myanmar as a province of british india but in 1937 you know myanmar was made a separate colony under british india britishers sorry, not under british india under britishers it was made a separate colony so at that time when myanmar was part of british india the time it was called as burma a lot of migration did happen from the neighboring bengal to the myanmar of today so probably at that time these rohingyas migrated to that region and you know bangladesh was taking this responsibility and india obviously said we'll help you but in the meantime what happened china launched its three step solution in 2017 itself in the later half of 2017 this three step solution was aimed at rehabilitating the rohingyas in myanmar only then india turned towards myanmar india said we'll help you don't worry we signed an mou with the government of myanmar on rakhine state development program and we pledged 25 million usd for constructing houses over there schools makeshift hospitals for these rohingyas and we started giving them money so if you closely calibrate india stand it was that we don't want rohingyas over here wherever you want to take them either bangladesh which happened under operation insaniyat or myanmar we are ready to support you because there are a lot of problems already here in india rohingyas presently in india they are there they are under detention a lot of them are there in jammu and kashmir also and they will be deported back the timeline has not been set because the government in myanmar actually is not there the military junta is ruling so it become it is becoming unpredictable you know to assess when they will be going back and now this new episode of 142 rohingyas being you know intercepted by the indian coastal authorities in andaman and nicobar island presently we are keeping them in detention camps we are serving them well we are keeping them okay but in future what will happen let's see whether these rohingyas 142 will be deported back to myanmar or back to bangladesh only so this we will see and the last is s j shankar in russia now india and russia used to have an annual leaders summit every year the prime minister of india and the president of russia they used to meet every year and this meetings happened till 2021 and uh, i would say uh, since 2022 these meetings have not happened owing to the russia ukraine crisis these meetings used to happen like this that one year the russian president used to come and visit india and one year in the next year the indian prime minister used to go and visit russia it was like this so this year was the turn of indian prime minister according to the convention which has been coming up since i think 2000 these meetings have been happening so you know uh, it was indian prime minister's turn but indian prime minister is not visiting russia this year it is the foreign minister who is visiting russia now there is a statement issued by ministry of external affairs because a lot of you know political spectators or commentators they are claiming or they are saying that is it you know pointing towards tensions between india and russia that the head of the states or the head of the government are not meeting so the ministry of external affairs has issued a statement and in the statement they have clarified that the time tested india russia partnership has remained stable and resilient and continues to be characterized by the spirit of special and privileged strategic partnership this is how we have labeled our partnership with russia special and privileged strategic partnership now on agenda so first of all the uh, indian foreign minister or minister of external affairs mr s jay shankar will be meeting russia's deputy prime minister and minister of industry and trade mr 
Dennis Martinov to discuss matters related to economic engagement. Second, he will also hold talks with Mr. Sergi Lavrov. He is the Minister of External Affairs or Foreign Minister of Russia. So, you know, this the discussion with Mr. Sergi Lavrov will be with respect to bilateral, multilateral, and international issues. The Russian President will not be meeting Mr. S. J. Shankar. Russian President also did not visit India during this year's G20 summit. Now, expected areas of discussion. First is enhancing cultural ties because a lot of, I would say, people-to-people -people ties are there strengthening between Russia and India. Some of Indian languages like Tamil, Sanskrit, Hindi, they are taught in Russian schools and universities. Apart from it, yoga has also become an important component of cultural ties between the two countries. So, how to deepen these ties? We will definitely look forward to in this scenario. Then next is bilateral trade. Now, bilateral trade, if I include energy trade, so energy trade, due to the energy trade, our trade with Russia has grown up many fold since 2022 because we are buying discounted oil from Russia after the onset of Russia-Ukraine crisis. A lot of Western countries or European countries have stopped buying oil from Russia and India is buying oil from Russia at discounted prices and we were settling the amount in rupees. So we have a huge trade deficit with Russia in which we are paying Russia with rupees. This is what Russia now does not need that Russia is saying that what will we do of so many rupees with us. We do not have trade with India where we will settle with these rupees or no other country is accepting rupees. So this is becoming a bit of challenge and this will be discussed settling payments and how to enhance trade apart from defense trade and energy trade because that also needs to be enhanced and according to some think tanks there is a vacuum in russia because a lot of western countries companies which were operating over there in russia they actually packed their bags after the russia ukraine crisis and now there's kind of a vacuum there in russia india definitely can fill up that vacuum or indian industries can fill up that vacuum in russia Next is energy, oil, as I already told you, discounted oil we are getting and civil nuclear deals are also on the cards because uh, Russia is one such country who is operating the two reactors in the Kudankulam nuclear power plant in Tamil Nadu. This is the latest of eight nuclear power plants in the country. So, any further enhancements on that definitely will be on the cards for discussion. Then, next is defense. Around 60 to 70 percent of the arms imports of India come from Russia, which clearly makes Russia the largest supplier of arms to India. India is heavily dependent on arms on Russia. Apart from imports from Russia, we also upgraded our defense partnership with Russia from buyer-seller merely to co-development partners where we are, you know, doing research and development also as partners and then, you know, manufacturing those products as partners. The classic example over here is the BrahMos missile, which has been co-developed by India and Russia. Bra stands for Brahmaputra River, Mos stands for Moskva River, which flows in Russia. So apart from import-export, that is already there, but we have also, you know, become co-development partners of each other. Actually, the main issue in arms trade presently between India and Russia is the delayed arms exports by Russia, which is, you know, hampering India's situation. India, no doubt, is also looking to diversify its arms import basket, but yes, you know, there is huge dependency on Russia, which we can see. And in this dependency, the exports are being delayed. That is something which is unwanted. So this will be discussed. Next is connectivity. A lot of, I would say, connectivity corridors we have established, like very decent Chennai, Vladivostok, sea lines of communication, which is basically a sea route connecting Chennai on the eastern uh, coast of, uh, I would say, India with Vladivostok on the eastern coast of or far eastern coast of Russia. 
then INSTC International North South Trade Corridor. International North South Trade Corridor basically goes to Iran, Bandar Abbas, and from Iran it goes to Central Asia and then Russia. Chennai Vladivostok goes from here, Far East Russia. Here is Vladivostok. So these two trade connectivity, I would say, projects will also be under discussion. How to streamline them, how to strengthen them. And with this, I've ended today's session. I will now be meeting you tomorrow with more such informative news pieces. Till then, you guys very well know what to do. Keep studying, keep reading, keep writing and most importantly, keep revising. Namaste. Jai Hind.